Three, two, one. Lift off. Welcome to the Ketamine Startup Podcast. This is where we talk about how to start up a ketamine infusion clinic, how to market it, and more. In today's episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing Catherine Walker. Katie is the CEO of Revitalist Wellness who has multiple ketamine clinics, including Knoxville, Johnson City, as well as Tampa, Florida. She's someone that I got to know earlier since opening my ketamine clinic. She's been doing it since 2018. And in this wide ranging conversation, we cover so much from the business side of running a ketamine clinic, even to her latest venture in AI. I really enjoyed this conversation with her and I hope you do as well. Let's dive right into the episode. Welcome everyone to the Ketamine Startup Podcast. I'm so excited you are here and either listening or watching. We have a very special guest for you today and her name is Catherine, aka Katie Walker. So welcome to the podcast, Katie. And before we begin, for those of the listeners and viewers who don't know, who are you? That's a good question, Sam. Uh, yeah. So who am I? I am a person who created a company called Revitalist back in 2018. And then I'm a nurse by trade, but then I have two master's degrees, one in anesthesia and one in psychiatry. So created the company in 2018. And then I was brave or bold or dumb enough to take my company public in uh, 2021. So still in the public company aspects with those, with the company or with the clinics too. So learning a lot about ketamine as always, but then also learning, it's forced learning with business. How's that? (laughs) So that's me. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. I think you're one of the few ketamine specialists who's actually taken a company public. Curious about what was (laughs) the that moment like for you when you're like, you know what, we have clinics or several clinics, I'm going to go IPO or go public. And tell us about a little bit about what that experience was like for you, Katie. Well, one day you'll be a good book. But yeah, really, Sam, I knew nothing about public companies. I've learned a lot since 2021. But I didn't, it wasn't my idea to take my company public. That was not my idea. I had people approach me to want to take the company public. And who knows, Sam, they probably did the same thing with you too. But where they got me was, I truly believed, and and I wouldn't not have taken this company public. If I had to go back, I would do it all over again, even though I've aged like 10 years and five. But basically, the reason I wanted to take the company public is because I wanted to push out as much as awareness as possible as to what we're doing with ketamine infusions. And I knew that we could accomplish that by being public. So yeah, so that's my biggest thing because I truly believe in it. I tr- as it. It's a miracle every day with ketamine infusions. I truly believe in the mission and I really do. I want to take big steps because it's going to take big steps to change the world. And I think becoming public, gosh, I've learned so much. If I would have known now what I knew then, I probably could have made a lot of better choices instead of learning from my choices. But it's interesting because there's a lot of people out there that are very um, opinionated. They're very judgmental as to the as to how you should do things. But people have no idea. They really have no idea from the different levels, from the ground up and from the up down. There's so many different things. So it's local levels, state levels, federal levels. And then my company's on the Canadian Securities Exchange as well. So it's international. So it's with the like filing capacities and different things like that. Like it's amazing, but it's constantly like being in an ER and ICU all at the same time. It's it's quick, but it's critical. That's pretty wild because for us, we're healthcare providers. We never really learned the business side or venture capital or capital markets. So for someone who you had mentioned you've learned a lot of lessons. So what's one, doesn't have to be a big lesson, either small or big, what's one lesson or advice that you would have given yourself? Let's say we can travel back five years and now you're giving advice to the five, the version of you five years previously. What advice would you give her? Yeah, so five years ago with all of this, I'm, I'm proud of myself that I was open-minded. I was probably dumb enough to see like with providers, like 
we're very smart and we're very intelligent and we can shift and we have critical thinking skills and there's all this other stuff. I didn't respect the world of business as much as I should have. And business is one of the hardest things. Anesthesia, yes, anesthesia is hard. Medicine's hard. But we have standards, we have protocols, and we can follow those algorithms. In business, you're having to manage personalities. You're having to manage people who are trying to take advantage of you, people who are trying to take advantage of your company. You're trying to protect your employees. You're trying to protect your patients when people are trying to make money off of you. So it's like constant that you're having to have a 360 degree view around every Thing. And, you know, and the thing with medicine is that person in medicine, that is our, that's our statute that we're protecting. When we come in together, I don't care what you say, Sam, I don't care what this guy over here says, you don't care what I say. As long as it's benefiting that common goal of that patient, that's medicine. That is not business. Hmm. Business, when businessmen come in, and I can say businessmen because I'm like, I don't know, what out of, a million females, I feel like sometimes in this, when businessmen come in, you may think that they're focused on the primary goal of changing the world, which is what I'm still focused on. And a lot of times they're not. And it's hard to read those different angles. So when you hear the term sharks, I've learned what that means. But it's interesting because they do. You have to really build a thick skin because you're getting judged all the time through every level. Like just learning those different pieces. I think I would have came in and tried to look at the possible angle of that person coming in to help me versus me expecting they're coming in because they believe in what I'm doing. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes. What I'm hearing is slightly different or even very different motivations and intentions is what Mm -hmm. I'm gaining where and every business know, person has their own so they it's, it's almost like a different company coming in and each businessman or woman who comes in they each have their own mission vision and values <laughs> so when they right. come in you're pulling in all these different companies at one time because you have to have right you have to have finance and marketing and and investor relations and press releases and public relations it's all these different pieces and you're having to follow the laws not only of the US but also in Canada so yeah would I've done it if I would have known this path would have taken me where I am today, like five years ago, I'm probably stubborn enough. I still would have done it, but I can see why people quit. It can get really hard and it's very taxing, not only on your physical health, but also on your mental health. And you have to sacrifice. You sacrifice things from your family and from your friends. I don't have a very big friend group right now because my company is my life. But yeah, that's just part of it. So now I respect businessmen much more. I respect, yeah, I just have a lot more respect for those people. I don't trust as much now as I used to, but I do have a lot more respect for it. And it's funny, Sam, I'll add this in there. I had a guy the other day said, why do you always say, hey guys, what's up? And I said, he he said, because you're a lady, right? You should be like, hey, gentlemen and ladies. I was like, most of the time there's no women around. But two, I said, If I said, hey, ladies, what's up? I said, more than likely, you guys would be offended if I called you women. And he started cracking up. Like he understood that point a little bit more. (laughs) It's so true. There is a lot of unconscious biases and in a way like ceilings. I 100% see that. And I have a daughter. She's now about to turn four. And it really makes me appreciate some of the challenges that women go through, whether it's societal standards or stereotypes, but it's very true that this definitely occurs, especially in the business world, as well as the medical world. In the medical space, the language that we speak in the medical space is very actually advantageous in the business world, but they don't really understand. Business people don't work with medical people for the most part. It's a very low percentage of. So yeah, it's completely different languages for sure. Yeah. And I do want to go back. I was actually reading a book recently, and there was a quote in there. It said, to be a light, one must endure the burning. And part of your company and vision is to be the light in the world. And so I acknowledge you and appreciate you for enduring that burning in a way of everything you've gone through, the ups and downs and challenges that you have faced, because it it is a challenging thing to do and grow. I appreciate that, Sam. Yeah, it is. And and maybe one day I'll get to the point to where I can do this first in front of a lot of people. And then maybe I could write a book on here's what not to do. (laughs) 
<laughs> because I do think people have a, a role. I think the medical mind can do so much in the business space, but you're exactly right. They teach us zero business, right? It's the same way as they teach us zero about insurance. I know so much about insurance now. I want to vomit sometimes, but they don't teach us anything about insurance, except the fun part is you're ultimately responsible for the billing codes that you send into insurance for fraud or malpractice or whatever else, you're ultimately responsible, but they don't teach us how to bill. How does that work? Oh, uh, totally. I never got a class about ICD codes or CPT codes or how to bill and nothing like that in medical school. So it does seem like a big void in our medical education to become clinicians because it is absent in the current educational model. But I guess it's like on the job training. It's on the job. And then unfortunately, the, your coders and auditors, they usually just have a year's training after high school. So we get all weirded out by, oh, is this the right ICD-10? Do I have to be, do I have to have a doctorate degree? Can I just have a master's degree? Can I actually do this correctly? And it's people that are actually diagnosing our patients have a year after high school. So I'm pretty sure it's okay. But it's just interesting because the world does not make sense in medicine. We do this such phenomenal care on certain levels, but then you go and you, if you have meetings with the state, if you have meetings with the health department, if you have meetings with some of the federal nonprofits, they all speak a different language. Yeah. And, and they don't coincide. And that's, it's disheartening, but I think that's what medical providers could get up and start doing the business piece. We're well, in business too. It's hard. But if we could have more people like that, I feel like we could meld the system better. But right now, it's, and it's the people who don't know business who are telling us, or people who do know business who are telling us how to do medicine, or it's people who know medicine that are telling us to do business. And that's one thing, Sam, and I hate to say this, but I had a, a, my big error. I've had a lot of big errors, but I just knew that providers could run a business and we would be great. And that didn't happen. Providers running my business almost made my business go bankrupt. And the unfortunate part of that is because they just didn't understand business. And I just knew, I knew that I was like, we can do this, guys, but you can't. And it's it's unfortunate with those pieces. But yeah. I've corrected that <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're learning and growing. So I want to rewind and shift gears for a bit. So Revitalist. When was the first clinic? When did that first open? Can you remind me? I, I February 14th, 2018. February 14th, 2018. So it is a little over six years. And I was doing a little bit of research. And I know that prior to opening it up, you were practicing as a CRNA. And you had an interesting story where the group you were working with I recall they they were saying, hey, this is voodoo medicine. What are you doing? This is wild. And so tell us about that challenge that you faced and how you overcame that. Oh, yeah, for sure. That was a chance, right? That was a big chance. <laughs> but so I, my, my goal, right? So I was doing anesthesia. I was on call, went to five different hospitals. I did all the specialties. My daughter at the time was six, eight days. She was eight. But she, she was, she didn't want me to, she wanted me to pick her up and drop her off to school. And it was a big deal to her that I couldn't do that, doing anesthesia at the hospital, unless I was post-call. So my goal was I was going to do the clinic part-time, open the clinic part-time and then just work normal part-time schedule at the hospital to where I'd have more time with her. And so that was my goal. And then the, sorry, I've got great Danes that are to my right and left side here, but basically when I did that and I went to tell the group that I was doing it, that's what, yeah. So they, I got a decision. They said, you need to make a decision. Do you want to do real medicine or do you want to do voodoo? And I said, I guess I'll do voodoo. And so what they did, it was interesting. And I don't know how, like now I'd be like, I'd get torn up over this, but they just didn't give me cases for six months until I fell off. And I was actually a salaried employee with that. So they just didn't give me cases. And then, yeah, so it put a fire underneath me because now the interesting part about ketamine is this is the highest backed level of science there is with anything that we do with the brain, even anesthesia, right? Anesthesia does not have any type of cerebral sciences behind it. The way that we test a Mac for anesthesia is through your lungs. We don't test in the brain. 
So for us to actually be able to do psychedelics and, and look at EEGs and MRIs and all these different biomarkers per se, like it's, yeah, it's fascinating. But yeah, no, I lost my job over opening the clinic. And now that you're the owner and you went from an employee model to fully autonomous individual, because for me, I was working in the ER. I was working part-time, working at the ketamine clinic part-time. And for me, when I look back, I'm like, I don't think I could ever go back and work as an employee now that I've seen the light. It is much more difficult, but now that I've seen the light, I don't think I could ever come back. So for you, Katie, do you ever see yourself going back to the hospital and working as a W-2 style employee, or is that like completely out of the picture? Ethically speaking, like there was a lot of ethical issues at the hospital when I left. Um, and that was one of the motivating factors for me to start the clinic too. But it's different now, right? Because CRNAs are making like 300% more per hour than what they were when I was working. Hmm. <laughs> so, so sometimes it's more tempting. But yeah, no, I, I hear you, Sam. Would I go back to just see if I could keep doing it? I've considered that. But Sam, I've not been in the hospital since 2018 hmm. at all. I've been out. So yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. And could I ever, I can see why people do businesses sometimes and then just go, I was tired of the stress and I just want to go back to Monday through Friday. I can see why that would be applicable. Unfortunately, in my case, I keep getting more excited about certain things. So I've got 12 different partners with 12 different companies that we're working with. So yeah, no, if I had like, I don't know, 35 hours in a day and I only needed to sleep six, then I would maybe consider going back to the hospital. But yeah, but right now, no, it's not one of my, not one of my things on my list by any means. But I do respect the business people in the hospital now more, but I also acknowledge their ignorance more so instead of it being out of spite that they make decisions. It's just they're ignorant. Each side doesn't know what each side's doing. So therefore each side hates each, hates each other more, I think. Yeah. you And you mentioned something interesting because you have 12 different partners, you're juggling a lot of hats. How do you maintain that balance, if at all, as you're balancing, hey, I'm, I want to balance my health. I want to balance my family. I want to balance my kids or my dogs. I want to have time for me versus and plus all of these other things. Do you have a way to have that balance or not so much? No. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I look at life as like a sprint or a marathon. So if it's something to, now I do prioritize my sleep. That's a big thing that I do. I prioritize my, prioritize my sleep and I love baths. Like those are my two things that I need to do in order to maintain my mental health. When I look at things like a sprint, so I've been in this audit, this public company audit, and it's like a marathon, but you keep having to sprint with it. But I do little things to where I make short-term goals. So I don't want to burn myself out. And that's one thing you have to be careful about in business or in doing something like this is because you've got to stay in it. You got to stay creative. You got to stay focused. You got to have clarity because people will, and this has happened to me, oh, several times now. When people notice a weakness of you, they will try to push you out of your own company several times. And it's on several different levels. So it would be a provider versus I've been challenged by providers. I've been challenged by admin. I've been challenged by research. I've been challenged by marketers. I've been challenged by finance. But you get challenged. They will challenge you to push you out if they think it's a bigger play. You have you just have to maintain and people will know when I'm tired. But. I basically sleep, I rest, I do prioritize a daughter as much as I can, even though my daughter, she's 14, but she also knows that her sibling is the company, sort of. <laughs> but but no, but I do that. And then there's there's some of the partners that we have, like I'm partnered with a company called Wake, where they do the psilocybin retreats down in Jamaica. So like I will intentionally, I go down there for the medical, I'm the medical person down there, but I'll intentionally go down to their retreats to be the medical person just to change my environment sometimes. So I, I'm, I try to be aware of those things because I can see like how people can either go crazy or become very unhealthy. Who was it? The chat GPT guy? Yeah. Who, Sam Altman. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know his name specifically, but, but he was talking about, I think he almost had scurvy or maybe he did get diagnosed with scurvy when he was actually in the startup of his company. So I can see that like people can get really unhealthy. So now that I'm, this is my 
gosh, Sam, this is probably my fourth, my third or fourth restructure with this company. And when anytime you restructure, it's so stressful. This one's stabilized now, which is good. And it's like you grow and you restructure, you grow and you restructure. <laughs> but, but yeah, but this time actually, believe it or not, this will tell you where I've been. About a month ago, I called my primary care and I said, hey, I think I need to, I think it's time for me to come in for a checkup. And they're like, oh yeah. They're like, when you were here last, I was like, I don't know, 2022, 2021. They're like 2018. So I've not been to the physician in six years, Sam, until yesterday. Wow. Yeah. So it's one of those things, right? It's just, you get in, you get your head down. And yeah, I don't know if there is a balance of health, except you have to force yourself to eat, to sleep, to make sure you're taking care of your people around you. But then too, you have to have a support system around you that's taking care of you. So it becomes this like mutual village of trust and respect to where you hope the people that are working with you on the same level will tell you, hey, Sam, why don't you take the afternoon off? Just take a break. And I have people actually like that. They will recognize when I'm overworking and they will take things off my plate. So I have a beautiful team that helps with that now, which is really good. Yeah, I love that portion about the the team because to do what we're doing and to do what you're doing, I could not imagine doing it all by myself and having that team who's looking out for you, who is supporting you and who sees us when we don't necessarily see ourselves. It's really crucial. So Mm -hmm. yeah, that teamwork is so important. I do want to ask you about, let's say, so some of the listeners here, they actually don't have a ketamine clinic, but they're thinking about it. So Mm -hmm. what's one small piece of advice, either big or small, that you would offer to someone looking to open up their own ketamine infusion practice? I think the smartest thing that I did with mine is I found someone who helped open up medical practices. And he gave me, I didn't hire him or anything. He just gave me a bullet point list that had 50 bullet points on it. And he said, these are all the things that you need. And that was the best thing that I could have possibly done because it allowed me to start with a base, right? Because as when you go and you start your own practice, me personally, I was scared to death. I'm like the state's going to come in any day. Like I didn't know if OSHA is going to show up. Like I had no idea. And the more I called these people and I'd ask them questions, they were like, just do the best you can do. I'm like, what do you mean do the best I can do? Like you you should come in and like, I'm calling you to ask you to come in and, and actually inspect me. Like I'm doing something preventatively. And they're like, no, just do the best you can do. And if we get some type of complaint, then we'll come in. And I'm like, but how am I supposed to know what I'm doing? And they said, well, just do the best you can. And you know how horrible of advice that is? It's just not good advice. So I did, what was it? OSHA. I actually got Tennessee's OSHA to come in. I put a request. It took them 14 months. I put a request for them to come in and inspect the clinic. It took them 14 months. They just randomly showed up and told me all the bad stuff I was doing, but then I got it checked. So you got to be brave enough to do it, but you also have to be smart enough to understand what the law is. And I think that's the biggest thing, Sam, is I do understand the, the way the law is intended to be. A lot of people are like, just go talk to your lawyer. If you just go talk to your lawyer, you're going to be $350,000 in debt and you're not going to have anything done. One thing that I did is I would compile together as to what I thought the law meant. And then I would take in, and I still do this now, I'll take in a packet of what's the question and what's the argument, basically. And I'll take that in and I get my lawyers to sign off on it. So I do all the research for them and that saves so much money from those different perspectives. But I think you have to, and and two, right, with the law, you have to understand, and this takes a second too, like your state boards are not there to protect you from the law. The state boards are very gray in the way they interpret the law because they're not lawyers. Basically what the law states is you're supposed to interpret the law to the best of your knowledge or your lawyer's knowledge in the best benefit of the entire situation. So you can't interpret the law as to what's going to be best for Katie Walker. And so I can't look at it from a skewed perspective that way. I have to look at the law based on my perspective, based on the patient's perspective, based on the state's perspective. And once you start understanding that, then you can have really good conversations with your lawyer and get out of them what you need. But I would say that's it because people are scared to death of the law. And they think if you make a mistake, and actually I was one of these people, but they think if you make a mistake, you're breaking the law. And that's technically not true. 
if you make a mistake, the law recognizes that people make mistakes. But then you have to show your best interest in moving forward as to correcting the mistake and not making it habitual. Because if it's habitual, then you are breaking law. But if you're actually improving yourself, you're not breaking the law. So I think the state and the they're more forgiving than what we think that they are. But we're so scared of them, Sam. We're scared to death. We're scared to death of the DEA. And, and, and yeah, the DEA can be very scary. But like I call the DEA when I have questions. Because I want to know. And I've got five of their different numbers that I'll call them and I'll ask them things. And they try to be as helpful as they possibly can because they see that I'm trying to do the right thing. So I think that's the piece. If you want to start a ketamine clinic, it's do the best you can do. Expect that you're not going to hit everything in 100%. And also accept that you're a medical provider. So you probably have some type of OCD. But you do the best you can do and you keep doing the best you can do. And you eventually expect that you are going to evolve into that amazing business owner slash provider that's making the rules and making based on the ethics that you think, right? So you can treat your patients the way that you think is the best way that those patients should be treated. You can treat your employees the best way you think they can be treated. But I think that's the biggest piece is just don't be scared. Be aware. Don't be cocky, but also try to be humble. And that's, it's really hard to do. I think um, your humbleness exists when you just keep making the wrong decisions and you just have to keep eating crow, but you just can't stop. You just improve and keep going on. I really love that because I think as medical professionals, a lot of us have been that straight A student or I always this perfectionistic quality. And maybe what I'm hearing is that some of that doesn't ne- not necessarily apply or it may not have to be as, I need to know every single answer. I need to have everything. It's, yeah, let me just go in there, figure it out, and do my best based upon my own personal ethics and guidelines and what I think is right. And then um, going with that and being okay with, it doesn't have to be 100% perfect, but you, do your best is what I'm hearing. Low expectations, high serenity. So it's like you do the base. The law is not very complex. But it's with the law, like you want to follow the law the best that you can. And you want to make sure your people are safe and that they trust the environment that they're in. So I think that's the biggest thing. You've got to make sure your patients are safe. And if your patients aren't safe or if they feel something, and this is, shoot, you know this, Sam, being in the ketamine space, there's a lot of different personalities that walk through those doors. If people give you impression that there's something that you could do differently to make them feel safer, then it's listen to that. Don't be like, oh, it's them or whatever else. There's something about something, even if it's like the shade of a light, but it's something that these people are trying to feel comfortable with to express to you. And instead of providers like we are in the hospital, we're like, ah, just get over it. You're having surgery today. You'll be fine. It's, it's your, you have that capacity now to listen to that person and to try to understand that person's the impression of what's around them. So I think that's a big piece too, is we, we do have so much freedom, but it's our responsibility with that freedom to make sure that we're not only empowering ourselves, but we're empowering our patients and our employees around us. And I think that's, that's your gold right there. That's, those are the most important parts for sure. Yeah. I love that. At the end of the day, why we exist is for our patients. Is there, when you started back in February 14th, 2018, and so that you're wasn't on part of Valentine's Day, <laughs> very cool. Yeah. Is there a patient that stands out maybe in the first three to six months of your journey that you're like, yeah, wow, we really made them feel safe. We really listened to them and they had some remarkable results. Can you tell us about a patient that you saw or treated? Yeah. There oh yeah. There's we've got a ton of people like that. But I do have one very special person. And I've got a lot of special people, right? But the when we first opened, right? Because we didn't use therapists then. And I so at my clinics, I use therapists and I actually use them during the sessions, which is pretty atypical for a lot of people. But the reason I do that is because I had this guy come in and we've done testimonials and stuff with him and he's amazing. And he's actually been in remission now for about three years. But he came in and his, he came in with his sister who was a nurse and then also with a friend and he was just emaciated, Sam. He had a hood on, he was gray, didn't really talk much. And 
um, the basically the family was begging me to treat him that day, which is was pretty atypical. I would I typically wouldn't do that, treat the same day because I we were brand new still. And I said, I've got to get some type of sign off from your psychiatrist, somebody who knows you, because I have nothing. I had nothing on this guy. He just showed up. So fortunately, I called his psychiatrist and told him the guy was in. And his psychiatrist said, yep, he's a candidate and you need to work quickly. So I said, okay. So I brought him in, did the ketamine at a super low dose. And he was so severe. So his wife had killed herself like six years prior. He became an alcoholic. I tried to kill himself several times. And basically what happened in that case, that was when was, I, I do anesthesia. I know everything. Like I got this. So I'm sitting there with him and he has a lovely term called transference on, to, on me that I was his wife. And he had never gone angry with his wife for killing herself because she was sick. So he actually never let anger come up. And as with ketamine, sometimes those repressed emotions will come to the surface. So he became very angry with me and I kept grounding him. I would ground him like once every two seconds and he would just go right back. He would ground and go right back, ground and go right back. Like he was just so sick. And so for, uh, we got through that session. And but fortunately, the about a week prior, I actually had a therapist, Jeff. I think you met him before, Sam. But he came up to me and he's, like, "Hey, if you ever need therapist or something," and I was like, "Okay, whatever. I'm not going to need a therapist." So after that session with this guy, I called Jeff and I was like, "Hey, you remember how you said you'd maybe like to participate?" And so I actually got Jeff in, and that's actually how we started including the therapy during the sessions was based on just a something unfounded accidental discovery. But since we do that now, it's so impactful just because during the session, there's a beautiful window of where it's just purely you. And it's not like anything with the ego or depression or anxiety that's like guiding or anything like that. So the therapist, when they sit with those clients during the session, like I always tell people, it's two investigators against your brain will bring up stuff and you've got you and you've got your therapist that are trying to figure out like what are these subconscious patterns that are coming to the surface so we can identify these so we can break the cycle of things that are occurring i would say he was one of my the guy back then in october 2018 he was one of my definitely my most impactful people because he thought there was no value for him in life anymore and if he can see he has changed the lives of thousands of people now because just because of him showing up him allowing to be vulnerable with somebody else in the room, which he just wasn't sure about. So yeah, so he was highly impactful. Wow, that is remarkable, Katie. And the fact is that if you didn't open up and take that courage and leap, that person may still be struggling or may not even be here mm -hmm. present yeah. on this earth. Wow, that's a game changer. I have like tingles down my spine thinking about the impact that you made. And the impact that individual has made in the community sharing the story. Yeah. Now he comes in because he's an alcoholic then too. But actually now he leads AA. He's in remission. He's on no medication. So whenever I have people coming in that are struggling with um, addiction type stuff, he will actually come and sit with them and talk to them. And he becomes their advocate, their sponsor. Yeah. So it's really cool, right? When you're going the path that you think the universe wants you to go down or the universe shoves you down, as I tell people sometimes, but those highlights and that's what keeps you going sometimes, I think. Yeah, beautiful. And now a quick word for our aspiring ketamine clinic founders out there. If you've tuned into our episode today, chances are you're curious about the ins and outs of starting up a ketamine clinic. It's an exciting field, but let's face it, the journey from idea to actually opening day can be quite daunting. That's why we've created something special for you. Think of it as your personal roadmap, a free downloadable checklist that lays out the essential steps you need to consider when starting up your own ketamine clinic. This checklist is designed to help you avoid common pitfalls and launch your trajectory to success. So how can you get your hands on this checklist? Simple. Just visit www.ketaminestartup.com forward slash checklist and grab your free copy today. We've made it easy and accessible because we believe in supporting our community with valuable resources. KetamineStartup.com forward slash checklist. All right, let's get back to our discussion. Stay tuned and don't forget to download your free checklist during or after the podcast. So you opened up Revitalist six plus years ago and then 
there was a moment when you said, maybe I need to have more or open up a second one, or maybe I need to acquire. Cause I think if I'm not mistaken, you like, once you went public, this was pretty surprising to me, but I had a colleague of mine and I think you acquired his clinic in Virginia, which I was like, that's interesting. Tell me about growing and what that was like for you. And I know you're acquiring and building. So what was that experience like? I personally, as a provider, did an amazing job, <laughs> but I did, not meet, <laughs> I did not meet the expectations of my investors at that time. Mm-hmm. So this is, again, this is one of those <laughs> business lessons, right? And this is the right hand not knowing what the left hand's doing. So when the investors came in, they wanted me to open 52 clinics in 24 months. Whoa. So I took that challenge, right? I was like, sure, I can do this. I was like, let's just get going and we can just every two weeks, I'll open a clinic. So I had everybody, I had 25 providers trained, lined up, ready to go, doing all this stuff, right? And I was just doing a manual because I was, I was focused. And so I started opening up clinics and I opened up seven clinics month over month. So I was opening up one clinic a month for seven months. And my revenue was growing 300% month over month. And my, as soon as, because you're in the red, right? When you're losing money, you're in the red still, but then you get in the black when you're actually profitable. And we were about 30 days away from being profitable. And the investment team came and told me, I'm not moving fast enough. And we need to start shutting down clinics. And I was, none of it made sense, Sam. Like none of it made sense at all. That's when I started pushing against the people that I was in business with at that time that are no longer associated with the company because it was like, I feel like I'm moving fast. I know I'm just doing one clinic month over month, but I was just getting going sort of. And I had everything else lined up. But when I started looking back, because we were growing 300% month over month, I looked up and I was like, I I typed in, what is aggressive growth? Because I felt like I was moving fast and I know I do move fast in life. And like aggressive growth is like 7% growth month over month. Like I was growing 300%, Sam. Mm-hmm. So it's the end. And, and, and I did. So basically what I did is I had all these clinics. We had, yeah, you, the, your guys was supposed to be my 10th clinic. It was after I opened my ninth. That was when they started telling me that I had to start shutting down clinics. So what I did is I worked with a group to transition them over to telemedicine. Because, yeah, because I didn't. I couldn't do bricks and mortar anymore because literally the investors, when an investor says, I'm done, you don't have many options, right? Because they're done. They may have told you things in the past that they were going to do, but in real time, like they just changed their minds. So it's, it's unfortunate because as a CEO, you get dumped on every way possible. So basically what I ended up doing, because it was, if they would have, if they would have stayed in longer, and that's the thing with investors, they don't understand healthcare all the time. But if they would have stayed in longer, it would have been amazing because we were growing, like I said, 300% in revenue month over month. But basically what I did is I switched. I had nine clinics. The 10th one, I actually had to release that LOI. And then I switched six of them to telemedicine. I left three open. But now we're licensed across 35 states to where we're actually doing telemedicine with that too. So I switched that. But fortunately, this last restructure has been the most successful because now our month over month revenues, even with the three clinics and then the licensing across the other states, it's the highest gross revenues that we've had right now. And it's the most aligned my team has ever been. So that's the other thing, Sam, and I'm, I don't know if you felt this or maybe it's because I'm a female or because I have more of a nursing background, but um, when you bring in other providers into the ketamine space and it works this way or this is the way that we're going, you get providers who come in and say, nope, I don't want to see 10 people a day. I'm only comfortable seeing four or I don't want to do consults. You need to do my consults. Or I'm not going to take insurance. I don't believe in taking insurance. But it's just, you guys are horrible to work with. And you don't know a lot of these things. And that was one of the things, like with multiple locations, Sam, you've got to find somebody who understands how to keep accountability with multiple locations. Every location that I had, even though I said we're having standard protocols for the entire company, every location was doing their own thing. 
And when it was really hard because some of the locations didn't believe in offering therapy. And when it was just, what do you do? Get out and start firing all your providers because they're being not compliant with what you want to do with your company. So it's hard, right? It's really hard. Now I actually have a president of the company who came in and he created his own addiction centers in uh, California, actually, in Northern California. And he has 10 locations. He's been doing his own. He founded them 28 years ago and he's been running them for 28 years. So he knows how to run multiple locations and what to tolerate versus what not to tolerate. And so that was a really big piece is the providers as we destroy each other. We can. And so that's that would be a big word of wisdom when you hire in a, another provider in your clinic. You've got to make sure that there is a chain of command. Because if not, then you all will destroy each other. And, and that's just because you have different views on different items. And it's really hard to keep that in alignment. I and mean, it's so true. I remember hearing a metaphor that having a team of clinicians and managing them, it's like herding a bunch of cats. And everyone has their own ideas and philosophy. So that accountability, alignment with your vision and your purpose and mission of the company, I think it's really crucial. And bringing the right people on board, whether it's a clinician, whether it's a business person, I think that's really crucial. It is. And when you mess up, right, the first time or the second time or the third time. Absolutely. So guess, as long as you have a job description and you have those bullet points and you want to make sure that they're meeting all those bullet points. Because the more lenient you get, the more it's going to shoot you in the foot, more than likely, mm. eventually, with those pieces. But you've got to have somebody who understands those business aspects for sure. For sure. And I've also seen other companies that were publicly traded and they were having the same pressure as you where they were, the investors were like, you need to grow, you need to grow, you need to grow. And they started growing and expanding and they did end up going out of business, several of them. And I won't mention any names. I'm sure some of them, but you're still here. And so what do you think was the difference for you versus some of these other ones who said, Hey, peace, we're done. We're shutting down. Then I'm a provider. Then I understand the business. Because I, I had to get to the point, Sam, because it was like I got like I would lose weight, like not sleep, like it, immense pressure. My biggest thing, and I think it's because I'm, I'm the founder too, but my biggest thing is people believed in me. And I'm sure everybody else felt this exact same way, but this is something that I do consider is I have had investors who have believed in me, who have put money in, who have sacrificed different things. So while I may not always believe in myself, I want to make sure that I do my best and I keep going, no matter if it is a hard day or a difficult day or a good day. I'm going to keep going because I want to, sh I believe in the investors who believed in me. And then, so therefore I keep pushing. The difference from the other companies that were out there with all these different pieces. And here's the funny thing, Sam. The original people who were with me who I pushed out of the company for a good reason, they were trying to sell the company to another company. And because, yeah, it was a good it was a good thing for them. And they were like, this company has raised seventy two million dollars. Like they're going to be in it for a long time. Nope. <laughs> like They're gone. They're out. One of them. Gosh. So you've got one who's a scientist. Amazing part has really good um, intentions on wanting to change the world, but he's a scientist. And you got another one who is a lawyer, wants to change the world, but he's a lawyer. You have another one who's a nurse. And it's, while the nursing one was different, I, I got pretty involved with understanding their story. But it was interesting because instead of having that gall effort of pushing out people because they're not benefiting you, I don't think he had the capacity to do that. I pushed out like six people in my company at one time, Sam. Um, wow. This was in August of 2022. I pushed out investors, my marketing team, my finance team, and my board. And I said, figure it out myself. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it was smart. Instead of the board pushing the CEO out, the CEO pushed out everybody else. And it was good. It was what, it's what needed to happen. But gosh, it was such a chance with all of those pieces. No, so these people, they raised a lot of money. They had a business plan that looked very good from a theoretical standpoint, but things always cost more. 
And one of the companies was, I think they were spending like $1.2 million on renovating these buildings for people to come in. And like when I open clinics, like I literally can spend like $40,000 to open a clinic. Like it's not that much money at all. So it's, you have almost penny pinch Mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing all this because low overhead, but you want to try to, you want the best providers possible, but you still have to afford them and they're very expensive. So you have to make sure that they are bringing in the financial needs instead of saying, I have a ton of value. You need me. I'm worth $500,000. And I've had people tell me that. And I'm like, all right, well, if you're worth 500, then you need to bring in 1.5 million so I can pay for the overhead that's associated with you and everything else going on. But providers don't understand that. That's a piece of it is why the other people went out of business. When you're a public company, if you aren't careful, there's a lot of consulting fees that occur and they're not people being properly monitored. So that's one thing that if you're not looking at every piece of every angle of every book, you're going to start seeing that your company starts becoming much more expensive from an admin standpoint than what it should be. And and that's probably what happened somewhat too with some of these companies. I was able to catch mine. Um, and that's when I pushed out my people about three months later because they were blaming payroll on me, like my payroll being too much, but their admin costs were actually more than my payroll. Interesting. And, um, yeah. So yeah. I, was, I was able to catch that. But yeah, it's crazy, Sam. Crazy world. Yeah. You bring up a good point about having autonomy, having control, the fact that you were able to influence and get the wrong people off the ship. That's really important. Sounds like some of these other companies were not able to do that. And then also the low overhead and as in particular, whether it's the physical build out or the administrative or consulting fees, like I think all of it needs to be really lean, especially when you're growing and first starting out. Absolutely. And you have to understand that you have to be flexible, right? And a lot of people as providers, we think we are, but we're not because we don't understand all the different pieces. So you have to understand the laws, but you also have to understand the bylaws. And I noticed that's a really big language barrier for a lot of providers because they think that the bylaws in the hospital are the state laws. Mm. They are not. So when you come out, if you're checking your drugs twice a day and you're signing them off in the mornings and the evenings, that's the bylaw of the hospital. The DEA, believe it or not, (laughs) which when they told, they go, how often do you count your drugs? And I was like, once in the morning, once in the evening. And they're like, no, like you have to count them twice a year. And I was like, what? I count twice. (laughs) That's all right. Yeah. That's all you have to do with the DEA is count twice a year. But yeah, it's, yeah. So it's little things like that. Like you just, you have to understand those differences. And a lot of people I've noticed are very quick to judge on what they think, but they actually won't do their due diligence with figuring out the answer. So I used to have a lot of providers are like, you can't do that. That's against the DEA. You can't do that. And I was like, call the DEA and ask them. And they wouldn't. And I was like, why are you going to tell me that I can't do it, but you're not calling the DEA? Because I got my direct advice from the DEA. But it's so funny. I like, But they're scared to death to call the DEA. They really are. So that that's a big, it's a big barrier. And you know what? And it holds, it holds us back so much, Sam, as providers, so much, right? So I have nurses and I don't know if you've seen this, but this is amazing, I think. But Medicare has actually made some really big changes in their billing codes for nurses. And they'll actually allow nurses to do psychotherapy underneath the physician. And it's a billable code to Medicare that you can do. I had nurse practitioners who would come to me and say, I can't sit with a patient. I can't do that. That's not my scope. So like I call the board, like I have the board of nursing's like number and I call them and they're like, absolutely you can. Like you've all been taught communication. You've had, we did a psych semester in psych and all this stuff. They're like, you did therapy on people. Like we trained you to do that. Look at the NCLEX. That's a test we have to take. Look at that. And, and you can see like baseline RNs can do this stuff. I'm like, okay. And I go back and they're like, nope, not doing it. Not comfortable. I'm like, it's, it's talking. If you understand ketamine therapy, it's like, You sit there, you allow that person to feel safe. And then it's not like you're giving them like 
with this huge amount of universal insight, you're just allowing them to have the insight for themselves while they feel safe with you there with them. And so it, it's really neat because not neat. It's fa- it's fascinating, unfortunately, but we put so much rigid structure around us as to what we think we're supposed to do. And in reality, it, it's not there. It's just what, it's the way we mm-hmm. dreamed it up in the narrative in our head per se. Totally. Have you heard the story about Mohini the tiger? No. So there was a tiger in the Washington DC zoo And this was, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. And Mohini the tiger was in a very small cage, maybe 10 by 20 feet cage. And after years of living in this small cage, the visitor said, we need to make a bigger space for this tiger. And so they raised a bunch of funds, built out multiple square miles of land for this tiger. And they released her back into her new um, holding space. And after living in that small 10 by 20 square feet space, they were expecting her to just roam and go free and enjoy this huge land that they had created. But what was sad was Mohini the tiger ended up pacing in that huge space that she had in a 10 by 20 square foot space, never venturing out, even though that cage was no longer there. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And that kind of reminds me of sometimes with healthcare clinicians, providers, sometimes we're stuck in a cage and we've been conditioned to be a certain way and act a certain way when it's actually, there really is no cage now. And maybe we can push back on some of these boundaries that are almost self-limiting beliefs. And I think Sam, because I've been to a lot of meetings, people who like me, people who don't like me, I've been to those meetings and I never walk in cocky. Because that's the issue with medical providers is we can be very cocky. So I never walk in cocky. I try not to. But when I walk in, I try to see, okay, what angle do these people, who's my audience and what am I trying to communicate to my audience? So I think that helps you to keep open-minded a little bit more than us walking in saying, you know what? Ketamine sciences is the best sciences that are out there. We're changing the world kind of stuff with this. And they're going to hear what I say because this is the most unbiased data across the entire world, right? It's no, you're going to walk in. (laughs) You're going to instead say, I see you all have a need here with a shortage of providers. I see that the efficacy is about 30%. I see that you all are being misdiagnosed or you're misdiagnosing people about 80% of the time in the mental health space. How can we help you help you kind of thing? And when you do that, you're actually coming in to be more, you're going to work with them on their team to help with resolution instead of what typically happens with medicine is we walk in and we were like, how do I need to defend myself as to what I'm doing? Because there's so many needs out there. If we walk in and I need to defend myself in front of the state, it's no. The reason I'm doing this is because there's not enough help. There's not enough access. Providers are killing themselves all the time because they're too stressed. We have a huge shortage of providers. It's unaffordable health care. There's so many reasons as to really why we're doing this. And unfortunately, we're all on the same team, but we look at each other like we're enemies. So people are afraid of the DEA. People are afraid of the state. People are afraid of the CDC. People are afraid of OSHA. People are afraid of all of these things, right? But the only thing that each entity is trying to do is to help that person. But it's through their lens. So what you have to do is you have to try to hear it and see it from their lens as to how they're trying to help out the entire story. And then what do you have? What skill do you have that can help benefit their, the way that what they're trying to achieve to where you all can start working more in a collaborative manner. And then that pulls in everybody, right? That's when you start infiltrating the system. And that's when you can go talk to the universities and you talk to the state and you can talk to the DEA because you're trying, you're figuring out what aligns you based on your values. And not on your beliefs, right? Because the beliefs of the DEA is they're all bad. And I've educated like 10 DEA agents on ketamine. And I was actually very surprised on how little they knew about ketamine. 
So they have guidelines. They are very structured. They know when they come in, these are the questions I have to ask. And it's okay. You're doing your job. Here you go. Here's the things that you need. Here's answers to it. And then if you don't have everything, it's, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Let me get that. Let me get that handled. And the state or the DA or whomever, they give you a window of opportunity in order to correct your mistakes, right? So if you have a mistake, it's, can you just send it to me within 30 days? And then you update it and you show them like, yeah, that you're working in the best intentions of. And I think that's the biggest thing, Sam, is like, you hear this in Western medicine all the time. You hear this with big pharma all the time. Oh, Western medicine, they are they get all these bonuses from big pharma. And big pharma is, they're just out here just to make a dollar and all this other stuff. And it's, I personally don't believe that 100%. I'm sure there's bad people in every sector, but I just don't think they can see the whole picture. I think they see what world they think it is in, but they don't see that there's another world out there that may complement this other world. And I think that there's so much hatred in medicine, so much hatred. And it's the more that we can understand and try to communicate with Western medicine, and Eastern medicine and plant-based medicine and synthetic medicine. And we all see that all of these things are actually working together to benefit each of us. I think that's how you grow together. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's a beautiful way to wrap things up, Katie, and just this collaborative, open-minded, seeking first to understand and then be understood approach is really beautiful. A few questions, and these are just more to um, funsy questions. And let's see here. I have one that I'm curious about for you. What's a hidden talent or hobby that most people would be surprised to learn about you, Katie? People are surprised that I played sports in college. That's a big one that catches people off guard. Now I tell them, like, this is my new sport, right? This whole company thing. So yeah, so that that's that's something that I think catches people off guard a little bit. Hobby-wise, I don't have many right now, but I do enjoy painting every now and then, Sam. So yeah, I like the creative piece sometimes, for sure. All right, wonderful. And let's say that we had a time travel machine. And you could go to any time, past, present, future. Where would you go and why? Gosh, right now, just because of what we talked about, I would go back to 2002. Hmm. Because in 2002, I was in nursing school. And I remember actually where I was sitting, which is interesting. But that was when they told us that opiates were not addicting. And it was a 0.001% chance as to how someone can be addicted to opiates and how pain was the fifth vital sign and how we should treat that because that's what we're going to be criticized on. I don't know if you remember all that stuff with uh, Medicare, right? If we let people, if we let them go home with pain greater than zero, then the hospital got less reimbursement. So yeah, so right now I would say I go back to 2002 and I'd bring in a few more studies (laughs) to try to prevent the millions of lives lost based on incorrect data that was presented to us in texts back then. Because right now with psychedelics and with ketamine, as it's going to change everything. And I'm so excited to see all of those different pieces, even pain. I've seen people who have like microdose with psilocybin and like their rheumatoid arthritis pain will go away for 12 hours at a time, even though they don't feel any different. So it's like we're in a huge time right now. And we don't see it yet because think because we're in it, but we're in a huge transition piece with all the psychedelics and things. And I think that we're going to be able to save a lot of lives, but I think there's going to be a lot of rigid boundaries that we're going to push against in order to change those things. But I think a lot of people are coming together for the right reasons. When you hear, oh, the world's worse now than it ever was, like I'm actually excited because I feel like there's a lot of angles of strategy on different communities coming together to make more positive change. So yeah, so if I could go back, I'd go back to 2002, but I'm I'm pretty excited where we are right now. And I'm grateful for this long road that I've had because I'm grateful to be a part of the community and having people like you and everybody around who's really been leaders and people have told us we're crazy as to what we're doing. Like now they're starting to see, oh, wow, like, Maybe they did see something that I didn't see. So I think it's going to be really neat to see the future and see how we can kind of mold into that based on what we started creating that we had no idea as to what we were doing. 
Awesome. Great, great answer. And for those listeners and viewers who are curious to learn more about you and what the latest things and projects that you're working on, what is the best way to get a hold of you? I don't know if you're on Instagram or website or what's the LinkedIn, like what's the best way if people are curious to learn more about you and some of the projects you're working on? So believe it or not, I have my own website now. So they can go to katherineawalker.com. So that's my website. But then I have, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. And then also I've become a, I don't know if you've seen this lately, but I've become a, an AI bot. So I'm actually working with a research and development company on LinkedIn named it's Kate at Neuropsych. So yeah, so she's, she's going with this through our adventures, you know, right? Imitating what I'm doing, but a little bit different. So yeah, so I'm on all the social media platforms. You can check out my website or if you want to check out the company, they can go to revitalist.com. Beautiful. And we'll put all of those links in the show notes. And I do want to shout out to this Kate Neuropsych. I'm pulling it up here on Instagram. It, it looks very similar to you, but the intro here it says, Kate is an AI bot that is a global influencer working with her amazing team, Sama Therapeutics and Revitalist. They are here to change the world. So that is very cool. You're on the cutting edge. And before we wrap up, is there anything else that you want to share? Any ideas, any last uh, comments, concerns, complaints before we wrap up, Katie? Not at all, Sam. And, and I think my email is katherinewalker at revitalist.com. And people oftentimes are saying, why are you helping me? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just the right thing to do. If people want to get into the space, I do help certain people that get into the space or people have random questions. Like I'm happy to answer random questions. And and I do try to make time because I wish someone would have made time for me during that time too. And I think you're one of those too, Sam. If people have a question, we're not going to be like, oh no, I'm not answering that. It's a community where we come together. So if people want to reach out and email me, like I usually don't email you the same day. But typically I will respond. So people have a bullet point list of questions. Like I'll answer the questions. Like I said, because we all have to be here to help each other in order to move forward because this is much bigger than any of us know. The cultures, the ethnicities, the sexes, like whatever you want to say, ketamine and psychedelics are going to cross every state line and every country line across the world because it's the common language is the brain. And the more we can come together, the more we can change all of this. So yeah, I'm always here if anybody wants to reach out. Thank you so much for your time, Katie. We really appreciate you being here. And kudos to you. Thank you for being one of the pioneers and leaders in this space. I'm so glad that we met many years ago. And it's really been a tremendous pleasure and inspiration watching you on your journey. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. It's not been easy, but I'm going to keep going, right? And I have the same respect for you because, you, yeah, you're amazing too. And I love everything you do and all your videos. Keep doing them because I know patients love those. And, and that's what we have to do is keep educating the audience. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.